Chapter Fifteen, Part One of A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett, read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage in September two thousand and seven. Chapter Fifteen, The Magic. When Sarah had passed the house next door, she had seen Ram Dass closing the shutters and caught her glimpse of this room also. It is a long time since I saw a nice place from the inside," was the thought which crossed her mind. There was the usual bright fire glowing in the grate and the Indian gentleman was sitting before it. His head was resting in his hand, and he looked as lonely and unhappy as ever. "'Poor man,' said Sarah. "'I wonder what you're supposing.' And this was what he was supposing at that very moment. "'Suppose,' he was thinking, "'suppose even if Carmichael traces the people to Moscow, the little girl they took from Madame Pascal's school in Paris is not the one we're in search of. Suppose she proves to be quite a different child. What steps shall I take next?' When Sarah went into the house, she met Miss Minchin, who had come downstairs to scold the cook. "'Where have you wasted your time?' she demanded. "'You have been out for hours.' "'It was so wet and muddy,' Sarah answered. "'It was hard to walk, because my shoes were so bad and slipped about.' "'Make no excuses,' said Miss Minchin, "'and tell no falsehoods.' Sarah went in to the cook. The cook had received a severe lecture, and was in a fearful temper as a result. She was only too rejoiced to have someone to vent her rage on, and Sarah was a convenience as usual. "'Why didn't you stay out all night?' she snapped. Sarah laid her purchases on the table. "'Here are the things,' she said. The cook looked them over, grumbling. She was in a very savage humour indeed. "'May I have something to eat?' Sarah asked, rather faintly. "'Tea's over and done with,' was the answer. "'Did you expect me to keep it hot for you?' Sarah stood silent for a second. "'I had no dinner,' she said next and her voice was quite low. She made it low, because she was afraid it would tremble. "'There's some bread in the pantry,' said the cook. "'That's all you'll get at this time of day.' Sarah went and found the bread. It was old and hard and dry. The cook was in too vicious a humour to give her anything to eat with it. It was always safe and easy to vent her spite on Sarah. Really, it was hard for the child to climb the three long flights of stairs leading to her attic. She often found them long and steep when she was tired, but to-night it seemed as if she would never reach the top. Several times she was obliged to stop to rest. When she reached the top landing she was glad to see the glimmer of a light coming from under her door. That meant that Ermengarde had managed to creep up to pay her a visit. There was some comfort in that. It was better than to go into the room alone and find it empty and desolate. The mere presence of plump, comfortable Ermengarde, wrapped in her red shawl, would warm it up a little. Yes. There Ermengarde was when she opened the door. She was sitting in the middle of the bed, with her feet tucked safely under her. She had never become intimate with Melchizedek and his family, though they rather fascinated her. When she found herself alone in the attic, she always preferred to sit on the bed until Sarah arrived. She had, in fact, on this occasion, had time to become rather nervous, because Melchizedek had appeared and sniffed about a good deal and once had made her utter a repressed squeal by sitting up on his hind legs, and, while he looked at her, sniffing pointedly in her direction. "'Oh, Sarah!' she cried out. "'I am glad you've come. Melky would sniff about so. I tried to coax him to go back, but he wouldn't for such a long time. I like him, you know, but it does frighten me when he sniffs right at me. Do you think he ever would jump?' "'No,' answered Sarah. Ermengarde crawled forward on the bed to look at her. "'You do look tired, Sarah,' she said. "'You're quite pale.' "'I am tired,' said Sarah, dropping onto the lopsided footstool. "'Oh, there's Melchizedek, poor thing. He's come to ask for his supper.' Melchizedek had come out of his hole as if he had been listening for her footstep. Sarah was quite sure he knew it. He came forward with an affectionate, expectant expression, as Sarah put her hand in her pocket and turned it inside out, shaking her head. "'I'm very sorry,' she said. "'I haven't one crumb left.' "'Go home, Melchizedek, and tell your wife there was nothing in my pocket. I'm afraid I forgot, because the cook and Miss Minchin were so cross.' Melchizedek seemed to understand. He shuffled resignedly, if not contentedly, back to his home. "'I did not expect to see you to-night, Ermie,' Sarah said. Ermengarde hugged herself in the red shawl. "'Miss Amelia has gone out to spend the night with her old aunt,' she explained. "'No one else ever comes and looks into the bedrooms after we're in bed. I could stay here until morning if I wanted to.' She pointed toward the table under the skylight. Sarah had not looked toward it as she came in. A number of books were piled upon it. Ermengarde's gesture was a dejected one. "'Papa has sent me some more books, Sarah,' she said. "'There they are.' Sarah looked round and got up at once. 
She ran to the table, and, picking up the top volume, turned over its leaves quickly. For the moment she forgot her discomforts. "'Ah!' Oh, she cried out. "'How beautiful! Carlyle's French Revolution! I have so wanted to read that!' "'I haven't,' said Ermengarde, "'and Papa will be so cross if I don't. He'll expect me to know all about it when I go home for the holidays. What shall I do?' Sarah stopped turning over the leaves, and looked at her with an excited flush on her cheeks. "'Look here!' she cried. "'If you'll lend me these books, I'll read them, and tell you everything that's in them afterward, and I'll tell it so that you will remember it, too.' "'Oh, goodness!' exclaimed Ermengarde. "'Do you think you can?' "'I know I can,' Sarah answered. "'The little ones always remember what I tell them.' "'Sarah,' said Ermengarde, hope gleaming in her round face, "'if you'll do that, and make me remember, I'll—I'll I'll give you anything.' "'I don't want you to give me anything,' said Sarah. "'I want your books. I want them.' And her eyes grew big, and her chest heaved. "'Take them, then,' said Ermengarde. "'I wish I wanted them, but I don't. I'm not clever, and my father is, and he thinks I ought to be.' Sarah was opening one book after the other. "'What are you going to tell your father?' she asked, a slight doubt dawning in her mind. "'Oh, he needn't know,' answered Ermengarde. "'He'll think I've read them.' Sarah put down her book and shook her head slowly. "'That's almost like telling lies,' she said. "'And lies—well, you see, they're not only wicked, they're vulgar. Sometimes,' reflectively, "'I thought perhaps I might do something wicked. I might suddenly fly into a rage and kill Miss Minchin, you know when she was ill-treating me. But I couldn't be vulgar. Why can't you tell your father I read them?" "'He wants me to read them,' said Ermengarde, a little discouraged by this unexpected turn of affairs. "'He wants you to know what is in them,' said Sarah. "'And if I can tell it to you in an easy way and make you remember it, I should think he would like that.' "'He'll like it if I learn anything in any way,' said rueful Ermengarde. "'You would if you were my father.' "'It's not your fault that—' began Sarah. She pulled herself up, and stopped rather suddenly. She had been going to say, "'It's not your fault that you are stupid.' "'That what?' Ermengarde asked. "'That you can't learn things quickly,' amended Sarah. "'If you can't, you can't. If I can, why, I can, that's all.' She always felt very tender of Ermengarde, and tried not to let her feel too strongly the difference between being able to learn anything at once, and not being able to learn anything at all. As she looked at her plump face, one of her wise, old-fashioned thoughts came to her. "'Perhaps,' she said, "'to be able to learn things quickly isn't everything. To be kind is worth a great deal to other people. If Miss Minchin knew everything on earth, and was like what she is now, she'd still be a detestable thing, and everybody would hate her. Lots of clever people have done harm, and have been wicked. Look at Robespierre!' She stopped, and examined Ermengarde's countenance, which was beginning to look bewildered. "'Don't you remember?' she demanded. "'I told you about him not long ago. I believe you've forgotten.' "'Well, I don't remember all of it.' admitted Ermengarde. "'Well, you wait a minute,' said Sarah, "'and I'll take off my wet things, and wrap myself in the coverlet, and I'll tell you over again.' She took off her hat and coat, and hung them on a nail against the wall, and she changed her wet shoes for an old pair of slippers. Then she dumped on the bed, and drawing the coverlet about her shoulders, sat with her arms round her knees. "'Now listen,' she said. She plunged into the gory records of the French Revolution, and told such stories of it, that Ermengarde's eyes grew round with alarm, and she held her breath. But though she was rather terrified, there was a delightful thrill in listening, and she was not likely to forget Robespierre again, or to have any doubts about the Princesse de Lamballe. "'You know they put her head on a pike and danced round it,' Sarah explained, "'and she had beautiful floating blonde hair, and when I think of her, I never see her head on her body, but always on a pike, with those furious people dancing and howling.' It was agreed that Mr. St. John was to be told the plan they had made, and, for the present, the books were to be left in the attic. "'Now let's tell each other things,' said Sarah. "'How are you getting on with your French lessons?' "'Ever so much better since the last time I came up here and you explained the conjugations. Miss Minchin could not understand why I did my exercises so well that first morning.' Sarah laughed a little and hugged her knees. "'She doesn't understand why Lottie is doing her sums so well,' she said. "'But it is because she creeps up here too, and I help her.' She glanced round the room. "'The attic would be rather nice, if it wasn't so dreadful,' she said, laughing again. "'It's a good place to pretend in.' The truth was that Ermengarde did not know anything of the sometimes almost unbearable side of life in the attic, and she had not a sufficiently vivid imagination to depict it for herself. On the rare occasions that she could reach Sarah's room, she only saw the side of it which was made exciting by things which were pretended and stories which were told. 
Her visits partook of the character of adventures, and though sometimes Sarah looked rather pale, and it was not to be denied that she had grown very thin, her proud little spirit would not admit of complaints. She had never confessed that at times she was almost ravenous with hunger, as she was to-night. She was growing rapidly, and her constant walking and running about would have given her a keen appetite, even if she had had abundant and regular meals of a much more nourishing nature than the unappetizing, inferior food snatched at such odd times as suited the kitchen convenience. She was growing used to a certain gnawing feeling in her young stomach. "'I suppose soldiers feel like this when they are on long and weary march,' she often said to herself. She liked the sound of the phrase, long and weary march. It made her feel rather like a soldier. She had also a quaint sense of being a hostess in the attic. "'If I lived in a castle,' she argued, and Ermengarde was the lady of another castle, and came to see me, with knights and squires and vassals riding with her, and pennons flying, when I heard the clarions sounding outside the drawbridge, I should go down to receive her, and I should spread feasts in the banquet-hall, and call in minstrels to sing and play and relate romances. When she comes into the attic, I can't spread feasts, but I can tell stories, and not let her know disagreeable things. I dare say poor Chatelaines had to do that in time of famine, when their lands had been pillaged. She was a proud, brave little Chatelaine, and dispensed generously the one hospitality she could offer, the dreams she dreamed, the visions she saw, the imaginings which were her joy and comfort. So as they sat together, Ermengarde did not know that she was faint as well as ravenous, and that while she talked, she now and then wondered if her hunger would let her sleep when she was left alone. She felt as if she had never been quite so hungry before. "'I wish I was as thin as you, Sarah,' Ermengarde said suddenly. "'I believe you're thinner than you used to be. Your eyes look so big, and look at the sharp little bones sticking out of your elbow.' Sarah pulled down her sleeve, which had pushed itself up. "'I always was a thin child,' she said bravely, "'and I always had big green eyes.' "'I love your queer eyes,' said Ermengarde, looking into them with affectionate admiration. "'They always look as if they saw such a long way. I love them, and I love them to be green, though they look black generally.' "'They're cat's eyes,' laughed Sarah. "'But I can't see in the dark with them, because I have tried, and I couldn't. I wish I could.' It was just at this minute that something happened at the skylight which neither of them saw. If either of them had chanced to turn and look, she would have been startled by the sight of a dark face which peered cautiously into the room, and disappeared as quickly and almost as silently as it had appeared. Not quite as silently, however. Sarah, who had keen ears, suddenly turned a little and looked up at the roof. "'That didn't sound like Melchizedek,' she said. "'It wasn't scratchy enough.' "'What?' said Ermengarde, a little startled. "'Didn't you think you heard something?' asked Sarah. "'No,' Ermengarde faltered. "'Did you?' "'Perhaps I didn't,' said Sarah. "'But I thought I did. It sounded as if something was on the slates, something that dragged softly. "'What could it be?' said Ermengarde. "'Could it be robbers?' "'No,' Sarah began cheerfully. "'There is nothing to steal.' She broke off in the middle of her words. They both heard the sound that checked her. It was not on the slates, but on the stairs below, and it was Miss Minchin's angry voice. End of chapter 15, part 1